Welcome to today's special Roots Magic webinar. My name is Michael Booth and I am Vice President of Roots Magic and one of its developers. And this evening we have a special treat. I am joined by the lovely Lisa Louise Cook. Now if you aren't familiar with Lisa, she is the producer and host of the Genealogy Gems podcast. That's an online genealogy audio show at www.genealogygems.com and she is also the author of the new book The Genealogist's Google Toolbox and the DVD series Google Earth for Genealogy which is available at www.googleforgenealogy.com She's also an international conference speaker, a writer for Family Tree Magazine and an instructor for Family Tree University. And she's also just an all-around fun person with a great enthusiasm for genealogy. And tonight's topic is Google search tips and tricks. And I'm sure many of you have been frustrated by all those irrelevant search results in your recent Google searches for your family history. And Lisa will teach us the art of online search and show us how to achieve better results in a shorter amount of time. And you'll also expand your Google search repertoire and learn techniques tricks and tips to achieve better genealogical search results. Well, hi, Mike. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm trying something different this time. I actually have my little webcam there in the bottom. I hope you can see it because um, sometimes, you know, when you're doing these kinds of webinars, you wonder, is that person really there or is she in her jammies? What is she doing? <laughs> so, oh, we can, hi, everybody. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, you can see me? Yes, looks great. All right, good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, no jammies or anything. I'm raring to go. Um, although I do, Michael, have my tiara because I'm ready for the royal wedding tonight. So that's that's the next thing I'm doing tonight. But right now we are going to focus on Google search, and I want to give you some tips and tricks that are going to hopefully help you um, have great success. So let me just get my mug off the page here, and let's jump right into it. You heard great things about Google, I'm sure. But has this been your experience? Uh, let's say search results. 1,698,342. How in the world are we supposed to get through all of these results? Um, so maybe Google has lost a little bit of its luster for you. But actually, it is a very, very powerful tool. There are just some rules of the road that you need to kind of um, pay attention to that will get you to what you want to get to. And that, of course, is our ancestors. So I'm hoping that by the end of this webinar, you are going to say goodbye to fruitless Google searches. They are gone as of 2011. Um, because I don't know, every class I've ever taught, I've asked the question, hey, raise your hand if you have plenty of time to do all your genealogy research. And of course, not a hand goes up, because we don't have enough time. And we certainly can't waste a bunch of time doing a bunch of searches that bring hundreds and thousands, oh my gosh, a million results. Uh, that's just a time waster. So these tricks and tips are going to help you to comb through that and hopefully, again, make the most use out of your time possible. So, in this session, we are going to talk about some Google search basics. We are also going to move into some advanced tips that I think are really going to help move you forward, get you to what you want to get to, and then I've got some strategic tips for you. Uh, some, some tricks of the road that I've learned that um, get you thinking in a strategic way about your search. Um, it's very easy just to kind of kind of hack on the search box and, and toss in at keywords and just it's like throwing things at the wall and hoping they stick. And um, there are some strategies that you can employ so that you kind of get in control and the driver's seat of your search. You know, uh, nowadays it seems like Google is king in the area of search, but it's really important to understand the core search principles that you employ with a Google search, that those will take you much further along. Uh, it may be king, they may have you know, the most amazing, amazing algorithm out there crawling the web, uh, grabbing pages and indexing everything, and, and that's wonderful. But if you can't put your hands on it, then it's no good to anybody. 
The breaking news is, though, and I want you to really keep this in mind throughout this presentation, uh, Google search is an art. It's not a science. And that's a really important concept to keep in the back of your mind at all times while you're doing your searches. It's scientific in the sense that Google takes you very literally. When you put something in that search box, it doesn't understand the nuances of what you're thinking in your mind. It's saying, you know, okay, I'm going to take that exactly the way you put it in and give you the same exact results accordingly. So that is the scientific side of it. But in terms of how you're going to construct your search queries, the questions that you ask Google, it's much more artistic. It's like having that palette and mixing the colors, and you kind of have to play with it. It's very rare that the artist puts a color up on the, on the canvas and says, oh, that's perfect, great, no problem, let's keep going. You have to tweak it, you have to see how colors play together, and you have to see how keywords play together. Now, one thing I just want to kind of stop and mention right out of the gate, because this is often a question that people have. Now, I know we have a wide range of skills out there in the audience, and so for many of you, you may have already gotten past this concept, but I know that there are some of you out there who might still be doing this. It's something I actually saw my husband do the other day when he was doing a Google search. He typed in a question, how do I find the instruction manual for this refrigerator, whatever it was. And it was just a whole lot of information that Google didn't really need. And what it ended up doing was causing Google to go out there and try to grab a whole bunch of different things based on these keywords and the order in which he put them in. We don't want to ask our questions in question form. Does that make sense? We want to construct a query. We want to piece it together with the key components, only the components that we need in order to communicate to Google what we'd like them to go out and find. Google really isn't indexing entire sentences you know, in context as much as it is looking at the commonality of the words that are showing up on the screen, how often they're showing up, kind of somewhat where they're positioned. But um, I think you'll see as we move on through the evening that you're going to just want to let go of this idea of asking questions of Google in your, in your searches and really giving them the facts. It's like, just the facts, ma'am. That's all Google really wants from you is the facts and the direction that you want to go, and then it will try to return the, um, the best results that it possibly can. And again, finally, in terms of it's an art, not a science, it's all about casting a wide enough net to get what you want, but then narrowing it down in order to get rid of the stuff you don't want. And it's a fine interplay between the two. And that's why oftentimes for more complicated type searches, it is a series of search queries that you do, not just one perfectly constructed search query. And so again, we'll, we'll look at some examples of that. But I want you to be thinking about being broad enough that you aren't missing something, but narrowing it down enough to get rid of the unwanted, undesirable results. Okay, so let's get down to basics because in reality, it seems like, you know, probably 75-80% of your searches will be well served by just the basic search operators. And I want to go over them. Some of them might be new to you. Some of them may just be a refresher, but it's important to know kind of what's in your box in terms of the different operators. Now, what's an operator, a search operator? It's a symbol or a function that either broadens or narrows the search. And so that's what we're talking about, right? Casting that net uh, broad enough and get pulling it in narrow enough to get what we want and not anything else. So um, let's take a look at some of those. OK, first off, you probably use this one, the plus sign. Um, and you can also use the word and. So in the case of my research, I do a lot of research on the Burkhart, Burkett, Burkhard, <laughs> all the different variations. Um, that, that's surname out in Ohio. And so I might just do a general search, Burkhart and Ohio, which tells Google very specifically, here's my two keywords, and I want both of them. So I want Burkhart and Ohio. If it doesn't include the word Ohio, then it's not a search result that I want. And um, you kind of have to play with this. And as we look at these, keep in mind also 
you can combine these. These are really actually better used when they're combined together. So let's look at the next one that you could put this together with. We could look at or. So maybe I'll say, um, I want the Burkharts of Ohio or Indiana. Now notice, I'm not saying um, I want the Burkharts of, you know, I'm not typing that entire thing out. It doesn't need all that extra verbiage. That just sends it into a tailspin. I really just need to let Google know those keywords and the way in which I want it to work with those keywords. And that's what these operators do. It's saying um, it should have Ohio or it should have Indiana, but I definitely want Burkhardt. Okay? And then next, oh, so many times I get this question in um, presentations. People say, oh, I've got one of those surnames. It's so common. Um, you know, it could be the word soap or, <laughs> um, you know, I know somebody last name coffin or way or just a word that is used in so many different contexts outside of genealogy. And that's a tough one. Also, one like Lincoln. If you have the last name Lincoln, you could end up with, you know, a million search results that talk about President Abraham Lincoln. And maybe you know that your Lincoln line is so far removed from that, you're really not interested in anything having to do with Abraham. You want to focus on other Lincolns. So that's where the minus sign comes in, or the word not. Um, so we can tell Google, give me pages with Lincoln, but I don't want a page that has Lincoln and also mentions Abraham. So right there, you have just tossed a whole bunch of irrelevant um, results right out the window, and they're not going to show up and run your numbers up to a million on the results. Um, these, just these three alone can do so much to narrow things down. And again, you could do these in combination. You could say Burkhart, Ohio or Indiana, not um, Amos. Maybe there's a, an Amos Burkhart that's part of a whole other different family that doesn't have anything to do with my family. I might subtract that out to get those results out. And that's why I was talking about it really does take sometimes multiple search queries to really fine tune your search to where it needs to be to give you good results. So maybe I don't realize that there's an Amos Burkhart out there who's, you know, who invented the toothbrush. I don't know what he did, but, you know, if he's out there and there's all these web pages and I'm, I very quickly discover this guy has nothing to do with my research, um, I can then go back and just tweak the query to add this, you know, minus sign and Amos and get those out of there. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Build on your searches. More search operators, we can use quotation marks, and that's when we really want to get an exact phrase. If I say, I want Jehu Burkhart, and I put that in quotation marks, I'm going to get exactly that. So here's another way I can do some combination. I can say, you know, there is a Burkhart line that's out of Pennsylvania, and let's say that they happen to have a Jehu in their line as well, but again, doesn't have anything to do with my family. I can say, I want Jehu Burkhart because I want that exact phrase, but not where it talks about Pennsylvania, because my folks were never in Pennsylvania, so that just weeds those puppies right out of there, okay? <laughs> so um, think about that. Think about, um, but remember, oh, here we talked about broad and yet narrow. We don't want to, you know, quotation marks really narrows things down. So if my Jehu Burkhart tends to be Jake. Jehu L. Burkhart all the time, or half the time on these pages, if I put him in quotes like this, I'm going to weed all those out, aren't I? Because it's just going to take me literally. Lisa only wants Jehu Burkhart. That's all I'm going to give her. That's what Google thinks, and that's what it sends you. So um, you might want to put Jehu Burkhart in quotations, and you could even say or and then put Jehu L. Burkhart in quotation marks. You know, think about the different combinations and the different ways that they might appear on the page. And think like a webmaster. The people who put the information onto the web page, or even indexers, think about the people who are indexing the material that you want. Are they always going to have his first name first? Or are they going to possibly do Burkhart, comma, Jehu L? Ah, that one 
would throw things, and we would miss those if we only did this. So you might want to work with a, a little worksheet, a little search tracking worksheet to, to track which combinations you tried and, and or mix or match them into the query itself so that you catch them all without getting too many. Okay. So let's move right on in into advanced search operators because, oh my gosh, we have so much to cover. It's amazing. <laughs> um, again, these are symbols or functions that are going to further broaden or narrow our search. Um, here are some of my absolute favorites, the, the tilde, this, which is really a synonym search. Um, so if I put a tilde, the little squiggly, and the word train, and then history, I'm going to get locomotive history. I'm going to get railroad history. That is, I discovered this when I was doing some research on a great grandfather who worked for the railroad. And oh, what a saver it was. Using this again in combination with some of those other operators we just talked about, um, this was really terrific. So think about what are the other, again, commonly used words for the word that you're searching. How would a webmaster use? What words would they use? What word would an indexer use? Think about who's creating the kind of data that you want to find. And then there's the asterisk. This one uh, I discovered when I was working with city directories because I realized, again, depending on the location and who was putting this information out on the web, sometimes they would be elaborate and they would do the city telephone and address directory, or they would just say city directory. And of course, there are many different types. So when we put the asterisk in between those two keywords, we're telling Google, I want these two words to appear on the page. I'd like them to be close together. But it's OK if there's another word or two in between. OK, so it's like a placeholder, like a wild card. And so that way we're going to catch city telephone directory, city address directory. We're going to have a broad enough net, but still be narrow within directories. And the num range search. I love this search. Um, and it has saved me a couple of times. Um, this is where we really want to just cut out those web pages that are talking about perhaps something in modern times. And really, we are only looking for information that fell between 1790 and 1830, for example. In this case, I was looking for an obituary for Jehu Burkhart. And um, again, depending on how common your surname is, or the name of the person, or whatever it is you're searching for, you may find that all kinds of other results show up in a completely different era that are irrelevant. And you want to get those out of there with just a simple tweak of your query by adding this dot, 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 and the two, two dates on either end, you're going to narrow it way down. Let me show you what this looks like. What I love about this is you can see here, here's Jehu Burkhart, 1790 to dot, 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 1830. That's the num range. And what I love is that um, Google actually bolds the date for me. So it's bolding the word Burkhart and 1791 and the name Jehu. And the nice thing about this is it also, no matter how many results you're going to get here, you're going to, one, be confirmed that it indeed gave you this Different, this particular page for a specific reason. Here's the reason. It's 1791. That's within your time frame. But also, just by simply bolding these keywords for you and the results, it makes it really easy to quickly scan down the results. And you can determine which ones really look like they fit in um, to what you're looking for and which ones are, don't, depending on the position of the word in the, sen in the context of these summaries that you're seeing here in the results. So I really like that, that it gives you that little extra information to, again, as quickly as possible, scan your search results. OK, so we've gone through a lot real quickly. We've talked about those basic search operators and then moving into the advanced ones. And, and we'll be using those again more in just a few minutes. But let's get strategic, because it is more in search than just plugging in keywords or plugging in operators. And it's really about your approach, how you approach what your goal is. Um, I try to really think about what is it I am trying to find? What is specifically? Um, because sometimes we go into it and we just have these really broad ideas. And that's, that's a, your job very difficult when it comes to telling Google what it is that you want. So get specific. 
um, about your goal and then get strategic about how you approach it. Let me show you some examples of that. Now, my first strategy is to get the most out of results. So often, it's so tempting, we get a some search results and we say, wow, these look great. Okay, wow, this is right up the alley of what I was looking for. I'm going to spend some time here. And we go, yay, I, I met my goal. I'm all done. <laughs> it's like when we find a document, we go, yay, we, you know, we happy to dance and, and now we're all done. But don't stop there. We need to continue to analyze this goodie that we just got, this gem, because there's more we can learn from it. And that's why I have this graphic here for you. I want you to think about these search results as being the gray box in the center of the graphic. And think about, you know, this is a web, right? The internet is a web, and it is interconnected just like families are. Very similar. Let me show you how this works. You know, if you have found a great website, find out who's linked to it. Let me show you what I mean. Link search is a simple little keyword phrase that you can put in front of a website address to tell Google that you would like to know who has linked to that particular address. Okay, let me, let me explain what I'm talking about. If I do a search for the Thompson family tree, and let's say I find a great website that is just jam-packed with all kinds of gems about my family and, and all kinds of information, well, isn't it logical? that I'm probably not the only genealogist out there who found that family, who is related to that information on that website. And isn't it possible that there might be other people who have linked their family websites to the Thompson Family Tree website? And they're not going to put a link from their site to this site if they're not related, right? So why go through all of these random search results that Google gave you? When you could go and you have found one terrific site, go dig in further and see who is interconnected, who is linked to this website, because chances are they are just as interested and have great information that they can share with you as well. It's important not to note that we don't put a, any kind of space between this. So you just type in your search box on, in Google search, link colon, and then you copy that URL address, that entire web address, for the home page of the website that you like, and you paste it right in there, right after the colon. Now, keep in mind, sometimes we go to a website and we dig into it and we get further down, you want to go back up to the home page, the top level of that website, and copy that address, and then paste it into next to link colon in Google search, and it is going to bring up sites like these. These are all websites who linked to the one that I thought was terrific and had all this relevant data for me. So this is really good, valuable results. These, these results are ones worth digging into and spending your precious time combing through and getting in touch with some of these people and seeing if you can't make some connections. Okay? Now, not everybody's a webmaster, so maybe not everybody has linked to another website, but they might be related. So Google does all this indexing, and it goes out there, and Google looks to see what are those commonly used words in this website. What do they tend to be talking about all the time? And even though there might be another fantastic website very closely related to talking about the same family, those two sites may not have found each other yet. Right? Those two, the people who, who run those sites. So they may not be linked to each other. They may not have a link going from one to the other, but Google can determine whether they are related based on combing through the verbiage on each site. And it says, hey, these people keep talking about the same people at the same time in the same places. So we can do a related search. Again, let's say I take the Thompson family tree and I copy, and then I copy the website address, and I go to Google search and I say, related colon and paste that address right in there. That tells Google, would you go out and you find other websites that seem to be talking about exactly the same kind of thing? And here are the results. Again, super high quality results because we know how high quality the first website was. We've already determined that's our family. And so Google says, well, hey, I've got all these other ones and boy, they're talking about all the same things. 
this is a list worth spending your precious time on, don't you think? I think so. Let's talk about site search because, you know, so often um, we are out there looking at websites and, you know, again, not everybody is a professional webmaster, so they may or may not have a search box on them, but they may have, you know, tons and tons of great data. So how do you tell Google, look, I just want to, I just want to search that one site that I'm looking at. I want you to dig into all 1,000 pages that are attached to that website and go find my ancestors. Let me show you how. If you go, now, one site I tend to go to quite often is the US Gen website, at usgenweb.org. And uh, one is Sibley County, Minnesota, because that's where my husband's family is from, the Larsons. And so here's the website. I went up there and I just copied, highlighted and copied that URL address, because this site doesn't have a search box, but there's hundreds of pages. If I go to Google and I say Larson space site colon and copy that address, Here's my results. Now, let's say there are 500 pages on the Sibley County US Gen website. OK, that could take forever and a day. <laughs> and then we would miss the royal wedding. So what I do is I go in there and tell it, look, I really just want to see the pages that have the word Larson, because I'm looking for Larsons in Sibley County. And so we first we tell Google the keyword, and then we tell it which site to go look at. Site colon and paste it in there and there's two results right there. Think of the time savings. Amazing. But again, don't stop there. My strategy number three is to go within results. And we've already been doing some of that. We've been taking these great results. We find a good website and we go further to see who's linked to it, who's related to it. Uh, we search within it. But now, what if I do that search, but then I might have gotten um, 100 results with Larson, and I might want to still thin those down without having to start all over again. So here's the results that I had. And if I go in here, I can type right in front, Winthrop. They lived in Winthrop, Minnesota. So I would like to see the pages that talk about Winthrop and Sibley County. Or I want to see Winthrop and obituary the word obituary. And as you can see in some of these, it actually has the word obituaries. So it understands that, that the word is common. And then you can click right through, and here we are, to the web page uh, buried somewhere deep in that website uh, that might have taken me hours and hours to find. And right here, I can jump right in there, go to the page, I find Larson, I find obituary, I find Winthrop, whatever it is. In the old days, you had to go down to the bottom of the Google search page and add your extra terms. But as you saw in this search, as soon as I start typing them, it started adjusting the results. That's called instant search. That's pretty new. That's been out the last year or so. And instant search, is, uh, it, it's a little unnerving at first. It looks like it's trying to read your mind. But in reality, it, it actually speeds up the process, which means you're going to have more research time. Strategy number four. Uh, I was going to say this is my favorite. They're all my favorites. I can't say that. OK. <laughs> um, strategy number four is to think about visualizing your results. OK, what do I mean by that? Well, there is an image search. And maybe you've done an image search and, and looked for you know, pictures or photographs or whatever. But an image search can sometimes facilitate faster and more accurate results than just doing a text search. Now, we've been doing text searches so far. So everything we see comes in text form. It's a summary you know, written out that links to a web page. And I want you, as I'm showing you this, I want you to think about that you can use the same operators uh, as you did with text search in an image search. OK, so we can use and and or and quotation marks and minus signs, all kinds of stuff. One more thing before I show you this search is I want you to think in terms of the search option column. That's the column along the left. It's been around for about a year or two. And um, it gives you some really, almost like a little toolbar, some quick little places to um, refine your search. And it's particularly helpful when it comes to image search. So let me show you an example of this, um, plat maps. Now, I do a plat map search, and look at all this text. <laughs> that, that looks like it's going to take me forever to go in. But if I click Images, look how search results change. And it's not just pretty pictures. This is telling me something about which site has what I want. 
I can click line drawing and go strictly to a line drawing because older plat maps tend to be line drawings. They're not going to be those color maps that you were seeing that uh, are the more modern maps. I can come up here and I can refine my search. It'll do instantly a new uh, set here, historic plat map. And maybe that, now as you see, now we're starting to see some of the more recognizable older plat maps. You can hover over it and you can see here it says 1856. It's not just this map that is on this website, but as I get rid of that image and come in here and look at the website, oh my gosh, there's all kinds of historic maps on this website. And I could tell it which county I wanted it to look in, which state I wanted to look at. Um, I, I hope that this really strikes you uh, quite visually, if you will, that this could really speed up the process when you're looking for images. And um, as you know, I, I just love Google Earth and using it for genealogy. That's going to be uh, next month. We're going to be doing a free webinar here at Roots Magic on Google Earth for genealogy. So stay tuned for that. Make sure you sign up for it. Um, but this is a fantastic way to get a quick amount of resources off the internet and download some of these historic maps, literally. There are hundreds of thousands of old maps all over the web just waiting to be found. And if you look over here on the, um, the Google search column, the search options column, I can tell Google that I want large maps, small maps, maybe sometimes when you're a webmaster it depends, you know, you need a smaller sized graphic so you can tell it that you want smaller or larger. Um, you can do face search, photos, I just want clip art, I want line drawing, or I, I was uh, looking for some graphics, but I want blue, you know, in, in the blue family so I can actually tell it which color type graphic I want, and all of them will change accordingly. So it's, it's just a wonderful way when you're looking for visual items, don't mess with the text, go for the images. And strategy number five is let Google do the work. Okay, now already I'm guessing there's some of you who have said, oh my gosh, how am I going to remember all this? Well, that was one of the reasons I wrote my book, but more importantly, Google says, look, I, I get it. We've already thrown a lot of these operators at you. They continue to improve the search process, so they've built these things into advanced search. So don't worry if you can't remember all the search operators. You can head to the advanced search page. Um, you'll find it clicked next to here at the Google search box. You'll see advanced search. There's a little link right there. You just click that. It's going to take you right in. And here, written out kind of the opposite of what I was telling you to do in terms of your search. Uh, it's actually putting it in sentence form. You know, find these pages, all these words. I want the exact word or phrase. Uh, but don't show me this page. It's, oh, that's the minus sign, isn't it? Don't show me this page. I don't want Abraham, but I want Lincoln. I want all these words. See? And look at the top. It's constructing the search query. This is a great way to practice, too, to practice putting these search queries together and seeing how they work. You can uh, pick what type of format of material that you want returned to you. Ah, there's site search. And Click that um, plus and minus button because, hey, you're an advanced searcher now. We've talked about all of these things practically. Um, date. You can have oh, the numeric range. Here we can put in our 1790 to 1830. And we don't have to remember that there's a dot, dot, dot. Advanced search has it right there. And even down below, page-specific tools. Pages that are similar to, pages that are linked to, right? And so... You just click go, and here it's going to give you your search results. And you can go back, you can refine it, you can refine your search right there from the search box. So all of these operators that we're talking about are built into advanced search. I hope that if you go in and use advanced search, that you do um, watch how it's constructing the search query for you at the top so that it continues to build your own skills so that you won't always have to jump into advanced search. You'll, they'll start to be second nature to you, and then you can just type them in there yourself. Strategy number six, let's apply what you've learned so far in Google search, but let's expand it outside that Google home page and the search box into what I call the Google toolbox. Uh, as you may know, Google has so many different wonderful free tools out there that you can use. 
one of the things I try to do, you know, when I work on the Genealogy Gems podcast, and I know I've said, a lot of you have heard me say this before, is I kind of see it as my job. I want to put my genealogist hat on, but I'm kind of a geek at heart. And so I go look at this geeky tech stuff and say, hmm, these are all really cool tools. They're developed actually about an hour south of where I live, down there in Silicon Valley. But these guys who are developing these tools, they're not, believe it or not, they're not genealogists. What are they doing with their time? <laughs> well, I like to look at those tools and say, how can we harness that? Because there's a lot of online power there. And how can we harness that to get further in our own family history research right online? So I want to share with you just a few of the, the tools that I see as being in the toolbox. Um, again, this is kind of like what I talked about uh, in the book that I wrote. I tried to pull in all of my favorites, the ones I think that are really well suited for genealogy, and um, get those with applying these search techniques to each of them. And you'll see how this works. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of them. The good news is, even though it takes a free Google account, if you will, to use many of these, you only have to have one Google account. So if you don't already have your free Google account, uh, the first time you use one of these tools I'm going to show you, go ahead and set it up, but just rest assured that you'll then have your username and your password, and you'll be able to use it for any and all of these that you come across as you go along. And you'll be all set up and ready to go for Google Earth next month for that webinar. So, Mike, I want to invite you to join me back on here because we have a quick little poll that we want to do um, because I'm really interested to know which tools of the ones we're going to be talking about some of you are already using. Are you there, Mike? I am here. <clears throat> okay. I put the poll up, so go ahead <clears throat> and select all of the services that you're currently using. And we'll give you about a minute or so to place your votes. And hopefully these are ones that you're using fairly regularly, not that you've kind of signed in one time and, and gone. But I'm really interested to know which ones you're actively using. I feel like we should have the theme music from Jeopardy playing in the background. Okay, and we'll give you about 10 more seconds. A few stragglers left before we close the poll. Interesting. I'm really interested to hear which one's maybe most popular. Okay. And here are the results. Can you see those, Lisa? Um, I can't. So you'll have okay. to tell me what they say. Well, they're in the attendee view. Okay. So the results are Google Books is used by 66%. Yay. Google Earth is used by 63%. Wow. Google News Archive is used by 26%. And Google Timeline is only 14%. Very interesting. Okay. Hey, I am pretty darn impressed that um, so many of you are using Google Earth. That's awesome. And, and, of course, Google Books. I'm pretty sure I might be able to show you a couple of things maybe you haven't seen yet in, in some of these. But that's great. Good. So, And for those of you who maybe haven't used some of these tools, it sounds like Timeline will be a new one for many of you. Um, I'll, I'll show you some good basics here to get you started, and then you'll want to go play with them. Um, thank you so much, Mike. You know, when we talk about another strategy here, we're, we're looking at how, again, to apply the search strategies and techniques that we've been doing, these tips and tricks, and apply them to some of these other tools. So. Here, Google Books is at books.google.com. And of course, as you know, they're out there cataloging and digitizing books. And I say cataloging because they are very much expanding, um, kind of becoming this all-inclusive listing of every book ever written. But as you know, um, there's a small percentage that are digitized based on copyright and permission from the author and that type of thing. Let me advance my screen here. There it goes. Okay. Google Books is fantastic. One of my favorite things to look for. If you haven't looked for Old County Histories yet, um, you might be missing out because they are prime resources to finding Google Books because, of course, they're very often um, out of copyright. 
they're possibly in the public domain, and they, that means they have full view access if they've been digitized. So uh, an example of this is Randolph County. This is where some of my Burkettes and Burkharts were from in Indiana. So I just went in and did a um, search in Google Books on Randolph County, Indiana history. And bear with me as my slides seem to be slowing down just a little bit here. We're going to go inside these books. And that's one of the things I want you to keep in mind as we get into this book. Not just find the book. And looked, but I want to go inside and use search techniques to much more quickly get to what you want within some of these books. So here's um, Google Books. We're going to go over here and type in Randolph County, Indiana history. And I'm going to do my search. And it's, I was just amazed the first time I saw this one by E. Tucker from 1882. My gosh, I remember the day that I went to the National Archives and found it here in San Francisco. And I was thrilled. It's a huge book. <laughs> and here it was completely digitized and online at Google Books. Um, so, but here's what I want you to be thinking about. Sometimes we forget this little search box over in the left-hand column. This is search within a book. So if this book is 900 pages, I can go in here and I can type Burkett and click Go. And don't you love it? It gives me what they call snippet view each page. Um, where the name Burkett appears. Now you may have done this in the past, but I hope that you'll go back and then you will further incorporate so many of those search operators and search techniques and query building that we've been talking about. Um, I'm showing you just simple examples of how it switches the view based on the name, but you could add the not and the, and the quotation marks and the minus sign, all kinds of things to dig further because as you saw, like. Smith is going to bring up 100 results. So I want to narrow it down quite a bit more. But that's just one way to, again, save your precious research time. And that is, don't stop at finding the book. Head on over to the left-hand column and use the search field that is specifically for searching only this book. Um, sometimes, you know, we look at the one up above, and if we change that one where it says Google Books and we type in something new to look for, it's going to give us a whole different book. It's down in the column where we're going to search within the book. So here it is up close, just to, to show you. Uh, it shows you how many results you have. So if there's 84, that's a lot. I'm going to want to go back and incorporate some of the, the operators and those search techniques and, and tips that we've been talking about into that field to narrow it down. And consider this. You know, if you're searching in a traditional library, it would be very natural to go, as I do, gosh, I go to the Family History Library and I pull off the shelf, Randolph County, Indiana, because that's where my briquettes are from. And I got to thinking about, well, gosh, what's the difference between going into the physical library and having this online digitized book library, if you will? And I think the difference is, is that how much you can shake out of these books. <laughs> because if you do a search, and it's not going to just search titles. When we walk down an aisle in the library, we really are just searching titles, aren't we? We can do some more in depth into the card catalog, but they haven't digitized the entire book. So you never really know what's on all those 900 pages. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This really hit home the other day when I was doing a search on Henry Burkett. And um, so I said, I wanted Henry Burkett in quotation marks. Henry's a pretty common name. Plus, I want Indiana. And uh, sure enough, I got the history of Randolph County. He's very prominent in that book. But down here, I noticed the third item, A History of St. Joseph County, Indiana, Volume 2. And there's 929 pages. And lo and behold, there's my Henry Burkett. This is, to me, the true power of the online and digital search versus walking down the aisles of the library. And don't get me wrong, I love the library. I love getting my hands on the actual books. But I don't know that I, I would have ever pulled St. Joseph County, Indiana off the shelf. I just don't know that I would, because that's actually never come up in any of the research that I've been doing. But as I got digging into this book, I realized this is my guy. This is my family. and. Uh, for whatever reason, and, you know, it may just be that your ancestor is doing business 
with people in another county. But depending on what the interaction is, maybe they served on the school board, maybe they, you know, I don't know what helped build the railroad that went through that county, they could be mentioned in these books and you'd never know because who, who's got time to pick it up off the shelf and then leaf through all 900 pages? You, you get what I'm saying here. <laughs> it's a big time saver and I think that you may find some brick walls tumbling down as you find the clues that tell you what the connections were to the other surrounding counties. And here's a tip. Don't shy away from the bookstore. Okay, There really are a lot of free genealogy goodies in there too. So when we come to the Google Books page, um, you see on the right hand side shop at the Google Bookstore and many of us don't go there because we're not shopping right now. But if you go in here, you'll notice you can do um, search all the Google Books. So I just typed in the word genealogy just as an example here and click go. Okay, so many of these are all, of course, for a cost, but ah, there's a link here, and it's very small, but it says free only. Click that inside the e-bookstore, and uh, this e-bookstore is actually very new. Um, here are predominantly a lot of family histories that have been digitized, that are available for free, and um, that you could continue to refine your search. If I did it by date published, as you see here, it puts the... Um, most current date, it's going to go to the page that says what day it was published, and you can just hover over them, kind of just quickly scan through, see which one you know is, is of interest to you. You can go back and you can revise your search keywords. Um, search techniques apply to the Google Bookstore as well, but don't ignore the Google Bookstore and remember that free link. Um, it's, I just think it's fascinating just to go through and browse family histories that have been published, just to see what other people are doing and, and how they're putting their, their hard work together. Okay, let's see if we can't shake out a little bit more, okay? <laughs> We're not done with Google Books yet. Um, did you know that if you come to the Google Books website and you type in the word Ancestry Magazine, did you know that every issue of Ancestry Magazine, which is now no longer publishing, is digitized and available online? This blew my socks off when I first saw it. Uh, what an amazing resource. They published for, I believe, just about around a decade or so. And you can go in, click on the page, look at this beautiful full color. Okay, And we want to continue to use some of these things we've been talking about. So use your search within the magazine. And here, let's say I want to look for a, an article on immigration. And I want to search all issues. I need to click the all issues button. It's going to go through every issue ever published over that decade and it's going to pull up the magazines that talk about immigration. So next time you're tackling something new, let's say all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, I have a Swedish line. Now I've got to learn about Swedish research. Go to Ancestry in Google Books, type in Swedish and do a quick search. Think how quickly you could get up to speed reading some of the fantastic authors they have. You can scroll through all the issues, see what's there. You can refine your search, but this is a treasure trove of information um, to help you get resources and see who was writing about it, see who the experts are. And again, if you want to go back and see the entire listing, just type in Ancestry Magazine and you've got them all right there at your fingertips. Boy, I think that one alone is going to keep you busy for a while, <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, let's keep moving. Now, finally, before we leave Google Books, I just want to remind you that, that book search isn't perfect. Um, some pages are not high quality, and that means because they're using the optical um, recognition software trying to find the words that you're searching for within the page. If the page isn't very high quality, it's not going to catch them. So it isn't perfect, and we just have to remember that it's an art, not a science, and so we have to kind of go in and, and use different strategies. Use the advanced search. There is an advanced search within Google Books, and try your searches from a lot of different angles. Okay, search, again, isn't an exact science, so you want to take some trial and error. And if you're just not getting where you think you need to be, try it from a different perspective. And the search feature, again, doesn't always pick up your search terms. I found this that uh, if I, I was looking for a particular book, and it just wasn't coming up, and I knew it was there because I'd seen it before. So I tried an author search. Boom, there it was. 
I don't know what was hanging it up. <laughs> it's, it's one of those little gremlins that gets inside, you know, the internet. But for whatever reason, that book just was not popping up. So um, don't keep hitting your head against that wall. Kind of just come through the back door and try the title, try the author, try different keywords, um, and hopefully you'll find what you're looking for. All right, here's another tip. We're going to go underground with Google Labs. This is kind of the place where they percolate their ideas. You may have heard that I think I think Google employees spend about 20% of their time, this like their me time, their development time. Everybody gets the opportunity to develop new ideas. And when they get to a fairly, you know, high level, then they, they get them put together. They put them into Google Labs, which is really like beta testing. And so many things stay, many tools stay within Google Labs for quite some time uh, and don't really graduate, if you will. But others do. You know, Gmail at one time was Google Labs. And the different functionality within Gmail starts in Google Labs and then they move it up and launch it into the main program. So one of the ones that's my absolute favorite that I have found in Google Lab, Labs is the Google News Timeline. This is different than the News Archive. So if you go to the Google News Timeline, just search it in Google, I wanted to find out information about the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. This was um, a time when my great-grandparents were living in San Francisco. Don't you love it? Now, we talked about image search and the power of image search and the plat maps. Well, this is visual, is it not? And this gives us a different way to analyze the data we're finding. And you can sort this in so many different ways by decade, by year, by month, week, day. And I love that it shows you, um, the oftentimes, a picture of the page. You can click on a particular month, and then it will spread out and show you that entire month. Um, and here we're clicking right through to show an example of an article that I found um, that was digitized and put onto Google News Timeline and it talks about the earthquake. So this was a way that I could get back into old newspapers online, in my jammies, in the middle of the night, you know, reading up on the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. And yes, I have absolutely found ancestors in newspaper articles here. Um, gosh, all different kinds of wonderful resources. And the viewer they're working on is now a new and improved kind of, so I really like the viewer. You'll find some of these were digitized by Google. So they'll have their own viewer. Some of them are going to link into other websites. So you might be using their viewer. What I also like about this is that here you can look at a time frame or you know a, a span of time. And if you're not sure when something occurred, boy, this happens so visually, it really shows you. It, people were talking about it as of April 1906, and they were not talking about it before. So if I didn't know that the date was in April of 1906, I'm going to know almost instantly by doing a search in the timeline and maybe pulling out the view and seeing how it spreads, about, spreads out and gives me a sense of when this event occurred. It's also interesting because in the 1980s, as you move up the timeline, it, you'll see it again showing up. People were talking about that big earthquake again because we had the big earthquake or Loma Prieta. So um, this is a great resource. And sometimes people have trouble accessing, if you click on the article, again, this is beta, so it's kind of funky. It doesn't always work perfectly smoothly. Try right-clicking and open it in a new window. And I have found that works like a dream. Um, but when you try to click on the actual link, sometimes on the timeline, it just won't open. For, and that's just a glitch that they're working out in the system. So that's another tip is to right-click. And you can link to this article. So if you've got a genealogy blog and you find a great article, uh, you can link right to it, put a little snippet of this article right in your blog and share it with your family, share it with your readers, and tell people what you're, what you're working on. So that is, and, and again, to get to this, I think the simplest way to get to the lab is to go into Google search and type in Google News Timeline. That's going to get you into the labs area. So yes, there are digitized newspapers on Google. But search is expanding uh, into, and it's applicable in all areas. If you think about it, Google 
has one methodology in their search and a particular algorithm they work with, and they are applying it to all the different programs they they get. For example, they just you know they purchased YouTube a while back, a couple years ago, and so they've started to incorporate and move in the search abilities into YouTube, so that you can do more intense searching than you could before when it was just YouTube. Same thing with Google Earth. Search is integrating with Google Earth. Now, we're going to explore Google Earth for genealogy in depth next month, but I want to show you just an example of what I'm talking about because, you know, if what you're looking for is, re is location related, this may be a way to do it. If I come up here and I do cable car in quotation marks and I say Museum San Francisco, here I'm going to do a search. Now, why do it in Google Earth rather than just do it in Google Search? Well, for one thing, I learned so much, so much more quickly. I know where it is now. If I click on the marker, look how it just pops and comes right into Google Earth. Here is kind of the lowdown. This is the fact sheet on the Cable Car Museum. And my great-grandfather uh, worked on the cable car, so I wanted to learn more about it. I wanted to go visit them. And here's a link to the actual website and it will open it up for me. It's so convenient. Now this is going to pull up a separate internet browser window, window um, but all happening within Google Earth so that I can stay in the context of the locality of where this is. And there's photographs there. Um, let's try clicking images up here in the top. Oh, we can actually use image search right here within and here's video search. So. I wanted to see some video of the Cable Car Museum in San Francisco, and here I am watching it right inside Google Earth. Pretty cool. Now, this is just the Cable Car Museum, but think how this might apply to all different types of searching that you do. Again, I kind of say often genealogy is location, location, location. It's all about where these people were in conjunction with each other. and and that interconnectedness with the land and, and with locations. So why not do search? And let me tell you, Google's very focused on incorporating more and more search into Google Earth. Um, it could end up being your, your one and only search engine. And as you saw, the search um, options column is in there as well. And then we can just drop our little peg man right on here. Let's go in for a, a close-up view in Street View. And there it is. I love this. And you can use your arrow keys now with the new version 6.0 to drive yourself around Google Earth. And so here is the Cable Car Museum. And the folks lined up in the front who didn't know they were getting their picture taken by Google. <laughs> so you can, you know, go for a drive, check it out, look at the website address, um, check out some pictures, look at some video, make your plans to make the trip there all within Google Earth. Why not do it here rather than Google Search? So another quick little example. Let's say I want to go to Randolph County, and I'm thinking I'd like to know what are the museums out there, um, what are some of the historic sites. So I could say Randolph County, Indiana, museum, and I love this. It's going to fly me right there, and it's going to plot everything that it has in the search. This is pulling it right out of regular search results that is um, relevant to museums. And again, I can then click on the marker, it brings in the fact sheet, I can hit their uh, website, that web page, I can do image and video search all within Google Earth. Um, so this was kind of neat because then I could see what's available and um, I see the Garst Museum, that's actually a wonderful place, the Randolph County Historic Museum. This gave me a really quick and dirty way to find out what's available and who I might want to get in touch with to learn more about the history of that area. I hope you're as excited about Google Earth <laughs> as I am because I just think that is pretty amazing. Um, I hope, it's hard to believe, an hour has just wound around the clock and flown by. I know we've covered lots and lots. I hope, if nothing else, you really feel like the idea of having these, these aggravating fruitless searches, they've just died. This, that idea is gone. I want to put you back in the driver's seat. I want you to be the one who feels like you're telling Google where, what you want to find, uh, what's important to you, and what you don't want to mess with. Uh, you don't have time to spend on frivolous results. 
So um, I hope that this, if nothing else, I know we can't memorize it all in one, one hour of sitting, but we can get a really good grasp of what's possible. And I hope that this has expanded your, your ideas about what's available to you, because all of this Google technology that's out there, it's all out there for us too, <laughs> for the family historians. So I'm going to uh, invite Mike back to the webinar and um, see if maybe you guys have some questions and answers and, and then hang in there because those of you who are present are going to be um, available to possibly win some of the giveaways we're going to do here in just a few minutes. Okay. <clears throat> well, one of the big questions that we had, common one, <clears throat> excuse me, had to do with the operators, specifically the words and, or, and so on. And uh, in all of your examples, they were all in uppercase. And uh -huh. we had quite a few people ask if they had to be in all caps when you actually did the search. Uh, that's a good question. Um, do you know I always do them in all caps, so I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't think, now typically, Google is not case sensitive. So the, the normal answer would be no, it's not case sensitive. Um, part of the reason I do that is so that I stay aware of what I'm focusing on as an operator and what I'm focusing on as um, part of my, my keyword search. Um, because there are many words like the that Google just tosses. So I'm pretty darn sure that when it sees the word and, whether it's an upper or lower case, it knows, hey, that's an operator. Um, because otherwise it would, you know, they, it just tosses those little extra uh, determiner words that we don't really need. Um, but again, I think it's not a bad habit to be in, simply just to kind of practice and hone your skills in terms of constructing your search query. Okay. Uh, we've also had quite a few questions about how is there any way to do a surname search in Google? A surname search? Um, absolutely. Um, I think that's, I guess I'm wondering what the the specifics are because everything well, we talked about could be used within, within the context of a surname search. I think what they're asking is can I say I'm just looking for a surname Smith or something like that as opposed to just any wordsmith. Hmm. Oh, to, to say this is a surname. There isn't a way yeah. to tell Google, oh, wouldn't that be amazing if there was an operator that said this is a surname. But see, the way Google indexes and scans the pages, it wouldn't be able to tell that from each web page. So it can't differentiate. That's where you come into play in terms of giving Google keywords and information that help it so that it could, in a sense, only come back as a surname. That is, put it in conjunction with given names, put it in conjunction with locations. If you're doing searches on that surname and you're seeing this common word that's coming up all the time that isn't related, that keeps giving you results that are not surnames, then use your minus sign to get it out of there and, and try to, you know what I mean? So that's where that um, crafting comes in. You have to not only put the term in, but then have it be a two-way street. Watch what Google's bringing back to you and see the way Google is interpreting and what it's finding and then help Google get rid of that which is not applicable and give it as m much more you can give it without getting too specific. See, that's the real rub, isn't it? We want to give it enough so it knows what to bring back, but not so much that we've just cut out all of this other good stuff. So it, unfortunately there isn't a here is the magic query, but I think as you start working with this, you're going to get the feel of what I'm talking about in terms of constructing your query and um, giving it and, and analyzing what Google's bringing back to you. Good. Um, several people are chiming in saying that they believe that the operators do need to be in all caps. Ah. That makes sense. It's been so long that I've been doing that. <laughs> I probably read it somewhere and then just, that was it. That's the rule. That's a good way to go. Let's, let's say that's the case. All caps. Good idea. It's funny. I never, I never use the words. I always use plus or minus. I never use right. the, 
spell out the word. But um, let's see. People have asked about the order of the. Let's see. How many asterisks can you put in a single search? And I'm not sure about that. You know, I'm I've sure tried that. putting like. I've tried to do it within the word, as um, we've seen wildcard searches in Ancestry. Google didn't respond very well to that. <laughs> um, could you do multiple? What I would recommend is that you would do it, um, oh, I no, quotation marks around it won't work. You can have more than one asterisk, asterisk in your query. The, Google's going to say, I see an asterisk, and I'm going to apply it to the word in front of it and after it. So if then you have another couple of things and then you have word, asterisk, another word, again, the second asterisk is only going to apply to the word before it and the word after it. But uh, last time I checked, the asterisk does not work to replace a letter in a word. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to see that happen, but it doesn't yet. Could you do that with a question mark? Hmm, let's try it. Smith, let's try Smith. Uh, nope, it just brought back, uh, when I did SM question mark TH, yeah, I've tried this before, uh, it just gives me SMDH. It uh -huh. ignores the question mark, it threw it out. Yeah, Carolyn it Spooner. It. Carolyn Spooner asked that and then she said, drat, missed it by that yeah. much. <laughs> so, I hear you. Maybe someday. And then several people have asked about uh, kind of fuzzy matching. They didn't use the words, but like uh, sound X or slight variations in the spelling of names. Yeah. Um, the way that I tend to work around that, because uh, unfortunately you can't do a sound X type of thing or you can't do the wild card within the word, um, you can tell it, I want burkett, B-U-R-K-E-T, or with a TT, or as a Burkhart, or, you know, Burkhart DT at the end. Because my Burkhats definitely have all four of those spellings. And particularly for their, there's one particular generation where they were spanning, going from Burkhard to Burkett, and they kept mixing it up. So you could do a string, and, and that's what I want to, I've said this be, before in other presentations, you can't break it. That's a good news. You can't break <laughs> it, and, and you can't put too much in there. So go ahead. Put as many as you want. Put the ors in there, and maybe give it a location to narrow it down. Um, but that's the way you're going to capture the variations on the spelling. Okay. Very good. Uh, poor Ronald Dunbar, he is asking, any advice on the surname Town? So if you have a really common surname. Yeah. Hi, Ronald. Um, town. Well, okay. So my theory on this is it's kind of like, you, now I know a lot of you guys like CSI and forensic files and all these, right? We're all detectives at heart. And one of the things they do, and, and believe it or not, I actually watch a lot of those shows again with that little Google, that little genealogy hat on saying, hmm, how can we use what they're doing? They say it's not, there's so much that's common within a, a scene, a crime scene, let's say. You have to look what's, for, what's uncommon, what's unique. And I think this is the same kind of thing. When you're saddled with a very common name that has, oh, even worse, um, another meaning, <laughs> that's a very common word, that's the common thing. So what can you give Google that's unique and identifying about that name? And so that's the context. It's that name in association with um, a particular given name or a location or a time frame. Uh, maybe that word is commonly used in modern times but was uncommon back in the 1850s and that's when your ancestors were from. Go put that num range in there and narrow it down and tell Google, look, I want you to look in this range. Um, you're going to have to be kind of sleuthy about this and, and think about what are those unique factors and try to give those factors to Google as best you can. Watch the results you're getting back and then tweak it to hopefully hone in. Um, but uh, you have to kind of be the, the painter of that canvas, if you will. Uh, that, that must have struck a nerve because we've had a lot of people commenting, 
I sympathize. Uh, <laughs> my ancestor's surname is Champion or oh. uh, uh, William. They have to put out minus tennis balls or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> something like that. I hear you. But, you know, I know this, it sounds complicated to have to build this big search query. I recommend having a little search worksheet that you keep by your computer. And um, so you don't lose track of what you've tried. And here's the other thing, and I didn't even put this in the presentation, but I think it's a great little placeholder. Google Alerts. Now, I know many of you have used Google, Google Alerts, and I've talked about it in my free Genealogy Gems podcast. You can do a search on my website if, if you're not familiar with it. I also have um, a whole video series as part of my premium membership on all this Google stuff, doing video tutorials, and one of them is Google Alerts. The idea being, if you do a search and you've really put your heart and soul into constructing this search that builds around a very common surname, and you've got it pretty good, set it up as a Google Alert and let Google try it out for a while, send the results back to you. You can always go back and manage them, and you can have lots of different variations. So there's another approach to the idea of um, variations in spelling. Maybe all the the context, you know, parameters, the the keywords around that that name are stagnant, but you've got all these different variations. Set up a Google Alert for each one, and test that out, and let it drive for a while. Go back, delete the ones that aren't working, tweak them. But isn't that great? Because then you don't have to try to remember how did I put that together, you know? Because right. sometimes the string gets quite long, and it's been a while since you did that search. Use Google Alerts as kind of your favorites or your bookmarks for searches. Okay. Uh, I think we're about ready for the prize to give away Yay. some prizes. I want to give stuff away. Let's, let's do that. Let me see here. What have I got? Ah, my book. Um, this is my baby, and I worked on it all last year. It's brand new as of January of 2011. And um, all I can say is it's... I tried to write it the way I would want to use it. So it is a reference tool. This is the, the puppy that's going to sit by your desk and your keyboard. Um, it's got the complete table of contents with all the details so you know by topic what you're looking for. But in the back, I put this kind of neat little index that's how to, because this is how I think. How did I do that? How did I set up a Google, how do you set up a Google Alert? How do I do operators? And you can go to the back and do it how to buy subject to that exact page and you're there. And then the page is very, very step by step. Lots of images, so you're going to, you know, this webinar was very visual. I'm going to give you lots of uh, graphics in the book so you can really see what it looks like. But that's the whole concept behind it. It's hopefully going to be uh, a working toolbox book that you can use every day. And it covers a wide range. You know, we only got to touch on a handful of the Google tools that are out there, but we dig into lots of them. Uh, and in fact, this is going to be a great reference manual for the Google Earth that we're going to do next month as well, because there's lots of chapters on that. So I want to give away a copy, and um, Mike, you are in charge of pick, figuring out and picking our uh, lucky winner. Okay, here's how we're going to do it. We are going to use the hand raising button. Okay, so I need to, everyone to stop raising their hand. I'm going to, using the power of the webinar, I'm going to lower everyone's hand right now. Oh, you are so powerful, the almighty webmaster. Yeah, don't, don't uh, raise your hand. Okay, and what we're going to do is when I say now, uh, do you want to pick a number, Lisa? Okay, um, 16. Okay, 16. So I'm going to clear out the, the raising your hand, and when, when I say now, you click on the raising hand button, and the 16th person to raise their hand will win the book. Okay? Perfect. So here we go. Three, two, one, now. Okay, and it looks like the winner is Gail Johnson. Congratulations, Gail. Yay. Okay. Now, so sorry, I was going to just say, Gail, congratulations. Um, I'm going to ship this out to you directly to your home. So what I'm going to ask you to do is send me an email, 
at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And of course, you can always get in touch with Mike at Roots Magic, but it's genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And I'm going to ship that um, book out to you, and I hope you enjoy it. I uh, hope that it, uh, and I, I feel pretty confident it's going to absolutely reinforce everything we've been talking about here tonight. And for the rest of you, just want you to know, I put, uh, I went into Lulu right before I came online. Lulu is the place where I uh, have my little store, and I put in a 15% discount. It's it's there until the royal wedding starts, <laughs> and then it's shutting off. So it's there through midnight tonight, and um, that's going to make it, basically, it's like free shipping for you. So that'll uh, be delivered right to your home. Congratulations, Gail. We've had a lot of people ask, are there going to be, is there a handout for this? And really, this book is the handout. Um, so and it, it has a lot more information than, than uh, we've covered here in this hour. It does. It does. And it covers everything, I promise you, very, very step by step. Um, so you're going to be able to turn to a page and do exactly what we've done here on the um, webinar. And like I said, lots more because there's a lot more tools than just the ones we talked about. So... It's all there for you. Okay, and the next prize. Next prize, um, as many of you probably know, I do the Genealogy Gems podcast. It's absolutely free. It's on iTunes. It's at my website at genealogygems.com. And I publish about two episodes each month. I've seen, um, I've heard from lots of podcast listeners out there that uh, you're here on the webinar. And um, I have what's called premium membership. And so what I tell people is, if you enjoy the Genealogy Gems free show, you're going to love premium membership because we do a couple of um, members-only podcast episodes each month. Uh, the last episode I just published was a audio tour uh, because I recently spoke at Who Do You Think You Are live in London in February. And I took my trusty recorder and I ran up and down those exhibit hall aisles and was interviewing everybody and getting the scoop on what the newest and coolest things were that they had. So that was all featured. We've had Lisa Kudrow on the premium uh, podcast and Vanessa Williams. Um, but also included, just so you know, if you particularly are a very visual person, there is a complete video series. It's about 11 videos long. Each one runs about maybe 10 minutes, and it breaks down a whole series on Google. Um, in particular, one of my favorite things, which is taking um, Google.com and transferring transforming it into what I call the genealogy dashboard. It's called iGoogle, and we do all kinds of customization to it that just make it kind of your home starting place online to do research, and it's it's very cool. Plus, there's Google Alerts on there, all kinds of great stuff, and it's all in video form that you can watch um, there on the website. And this is a one-year uh, membership. It is not reoccurring. You don't give me your credit card number. It's just one free year for you to use and enjoy. Um, watch all the videos that are on there. Get the free podcast, uh, the additional premium members podcast each month, and uh, have fun with it. It's uh, normally just thirty dollars for the whole year. It's kind of like a magazine subscription, and um, let's give one away to a lucky winner. Mike? Oops, Oops sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Do you want to pick oh. a number? <laughs> Do you want to pick a number, oh, yes. Lisa? Um, a number. Does, is it bad if it's a high number? No. Okay, how about um, 32? Okay, 32. So I'm going to count down, and when I say now, click the little raise your hand button, and the 32nd person will win the subscription. So I'm going to clear everyone out. Three, two, one, now. Okay, and the 32nd person is Ed Merrifield. Ed Merrifield. Awesome. Congratulations, Ed. I, uh, now, if by chance Ed is a premium member, this would uh, I'll add on an extra year to your membership. Uh, if you're not already a premium member, then you're going to be getting um, a one-year premium membership for free. So what we'll do, again, um, Ed, 
send me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or you can contact Roots Magic and Mike, and he'll get it to me. But email me, and I will set you up with your username and password, and you'll be up and running and, and join membership. I hope you enjoy it. And again, we're um, doing a discount on that as well tonight. So feel free uh, if you are interested in particularly the videos. Those are kind of cool. So that's in there. But congratulations, Ed. Okay. Well, uh, I guess it's time to wrap things up. So thank you very much for coming this evening. And thank you very much, Lisa, for being our guest this evening. And uh, good luck with your Google searches. Thanks, everyone. It's wonderful talking with you.